Hi guys, uh, welcome to the 13th Pi Data Meetup. So today we're very excited to have um, Jeff Sion here. So just a, a very brief background about Jeff here. Well, first of all, he's the founder and managing partner at Studio Xora. He's also an entrepreneurial and technological leader with about 27 years. Oh, that's crazy. 27 years of experience um, prior to founding the studio. He spent about 15 years assembling various teams um, in the digital health space, doing um, AI ventures and stuff like that. He also has a master's and bachelor's degree in electrical engineer, um, computer engineering with a concentration from AI from MIT. And he also has a MBA from Harvard Business School as well. And he's also um, from Trinidad as well. So, uh, we're very excited to have you here, um, Jeff, and we're really very looking forward um, to the, the advice that you have for us in the So when you're ready, good, take it those. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Good to meet everyone. This is going to be uh, is something I've been looking forward to, and I um, appreciate all you guys uh, welcoming me. It's been a while since I've been meaning to come and get a chance to meet you guys. Uh, I didn't realize I'd have the privilege of speaking uh, as my first appearance, but uh, yeah, hopefully this won't be the last. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> um, uh, and I got a couple of questions um, before from some of you folks. I appreciate um, Chris, you and Jade and, and Torin and others sending across questions beforehand. Uh, so I, I really want to focus on, on those things here and, and really make sure that it is really serving the purpose for you guys in terms of what you have in mind, because you you guys know your group and uh, what you're all aspiring to do uh, better than I do. Um, uh, I guess I should just put in a plug for uh, another group that Professor Hussain, uh, Torin, and myself are part of, which is uh, uh, where we're a number of underrepresented people in the field of artificial intelligence, machine learning and data science who are trying to uh, do something useful um, in terms of profiling folks in this space who come from this sort of corner of the technology world and who have been doing interesting things in technology. Um, and uh, we, you know, a, a, a big purpose of the group is, is, is helping others who have entered into fields such as data science uh, rapidly accelerate forward in terms of um, achieving whatever success they want in their, in their life. Because for, for a lot of us, we feel we've been given the privilege, uh, you know, a, a lot of us started in Trinidad, a lot of us are Trinidadians, Trinidadians and Tobagoans. We started in Trinidad and we've been able to do a lot with, with, with starting from a little, um, so I, I guess if I could speak as the leader of the group on behalf of everyone's aspirations and Torian, you can add to this if you want. Uh, I, I feel collectively the central thrust of, of our group there is, is to move everybody forward uh, as quickly as we can because uh, we need more people of color in leadership roles in the industry, in technology. Uh, artificial intelligence is going to be probably for the next 50 years, what the web has been for the last 20 years is, is, is going to really accelerate where things go. And uh, we like to have as many uh, people representing there from the top. So uh, that's a little bit about that. So if you guys hear anything or you have the opportunity to come and spend time with us, we invite you guys to do so. And I know some of you guys actually came last weekend, which was uh, the kickoff session that we did. Um, so I, I, I don't want to spend all the time talking, but it, it'd probably be helpful for me to give a few stories, um, Torin, tell me if, if this makes sense. I can, I can give a few stories, but, um, I want to start with just kind of the summary, the short of what I do. So I build companies, um, so a while ago, I wouldn't even say it was many years ago. It was, uh, a vague dream that I could be part of building a healthcare technology company that was worth $20 billion. Um, but then it happened, it happened. Um, and so it, it is very 
interesting and opportune that uh, you guys have invited me here because um, you could sort of say I'm relatively fresh off of the experience of kind of seeing um, an accomplishment at that level personally. And uh, I can share with you guys what it took to get there. Um, but what was more interesting is, is not only did we have one company exit for close to $20 billion, we had another one. Uh, and this company actually had special meaning to me. It, it, it was a company which was built in the Caribbean that also got sold. Um, so I have not had a job since 2003. That's the last time I actually had a job or what they call here in the US a W-2. Um, I know a lot of you guys are early on in your careers or are looking at furthering your careers and um, getting a job is, is a big part of it. Um, but maybe along the way here, I'll convince you that there's other types of thinking other than just getting another job or getting, getting the next better job about how to go about life. So, um, look, we didn't get there by luck, right? Some of it was luck, but a lot of it was in my opinion, applying what we learned, what I learned from a place like MIT. Um, but the disciplines also that I learned and, and you will learn in developing in a fully structured programming language like Python, right? This is a Python group, right? Uh, so concepts such as abstraction and modularity, I see Professor Malalio is in here. So uh, good to see you. It's been a number of years, Kim. Um, thanks for the support. Uh, but really adhering to the foundation of, of how something com complex and marvelous is built. These are the types of things that Patrick and Kim and myself learned out of a place like MIT. And you learn from developing uh, complex pieces of technology in a language like Python. So we could talk a little bit about the architecture of my journey and I'll, I'll tell you some stories along the way. But again, you know, my, my my journey is pretty long, so I'll, I'll summarize it. Um, for me, you have to start with something that you love. Um, and I think when you learn something, when you love something, you could become really good at it. And when you're good at something, you could become a good engineer in that field, right? I, I, I approach the world as an engineer. That's my, my primary source of training, despite all, all of these degrees or whatever. Um, and if you're a good engineer, you could become a good senior engineer. What does it mean to be a good senior engineer? We'll, we'll, we'll talk about some of this stuff. If you could be a good senior engineer, I think you could become a good project manager or, or good software architect. Um, and I think that is an important step in people's careers because there's a lot of smart people that I know, that you guys know, who couldn't manage their way out of a cardboard box. And these are not the people that it takes to move the world forward. They serve a role, but unfortunately, it's a very limited role in my experience, right? Um, I have good friends from MIT. Um, they are some of the smartest people that I have met, I've worked with. They've done Max Olympiad. They have their PhD. But you ask them to open the garage door and they couldn't figure out how to do that. Right, and uh, they, they kind of have it hard in life, right? And, and their life tends to follow a linear trajectory, right? You don't, you don't see the $20 billion type of, of exits, at least not at this stage of, of, of your career when, when you lack certain skills of being able to manage. Um, so good engineer, good senior engineer, good manager, right? Good project manager or, or good software architect. They're, they're both manager roles. And if you could be a good manager um, in terms of managing projects with a team of like 10 to 25 people, uh, I think you could learn the skills of general management in business, right? And if you could become a good general manager, um, maybe for me with, with some additional boosts of confidence and um, accelerations like what I got the, the network I got out of Harvard Business School, I think you could become a good or great CEO. And if you can become a good CEO, then you could become a good company builder, right? You could, you could actually build companies without actually having to be in the trenches uh, 80, 90, 100 hours a week. And that's what I do today, 
right? I build companies, multiple companies, and sometimes I'll make more money than 90% of America within one minute of the day. Um, and it's because I've been able to leverage up on top of, 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 of this background of compounding complexity and compounding leverage uh, that we teach ourselves as engineers. Um, so when you think about the world this way, you come to realize that you don't need a job, that you possibly might be better off just creating jobs for people rather than having a job. And that, that's where I found myself. Um, but nevertheless, Python is a tool that makes the most impact in all of my companies. Um, but just for the record, I first encountered it in 2015 uh, with one of the companies that I built here when I moved out to Silicon Valley. And I actually learned Python 3. I encountered Python 2 in sort of the, the days when it was more dominant. And then I actually learned Python 3 when it started to cross over becoming the more dominant platform. That was probably 2017, 2018. So I'm also fairly new to this, just for the record, right? I mean, I've been a programmer since I was six, but Python itself, I've only recently learned and I, I, I do still code. So um, let me tell a couple of stories, right? Because I, I looked at some of the questions, I've talked to some of you guys, I've had the chance of mentoring some of you guys and there are some common themes, right? So I, I wanna share a few stories that I hopefully will be educational, right? Um, right, because you can sit there and, because uh, 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 you know you want to know where I come from in Trinidad. I come from Guanapo Village. Most of you guys probably have no clue where Guanapo Village is. Uh, if I told you it was near Rima, you still probably couldn't find it, right? So unless you came from La Hoketa or places like that down in the back where I grew up and spent 19 years of my life before moving to the U.S. Um, I don't think you knew you, you would know where I came from. I didn't grow up in Tong. I went to school in Tong, but I didn't have the privilege of, um, you know, what most people you would expect have the town life have as privileged lives. I, I, I did not grow up that way. I grew up in a village. My grandparents had a shop. I worked in the shop when I was 10 years old because the teachers didn't want to teach us anything after common entrance. So my mother, I told my mother, I'm not going to school. She said, well, you can't just not go to school. If you're not going to school, you have to work. So I went next door in the grocery store and I got a job. I stacked shelves, I cut pork, I weighed rice and sugar, packed groceries, 12 hours a day, seven days a week. And you have to show up early to open the shop and you have to stay late to pack everything up afterwards. So it was probably more like 13 hour days. That's what I did when I was 10 years old. And we'll probably come to see what that taught me later on in the story. But that's, that's one quick story. Um, and I, I want you guys to keep these stories in mind because there's a theme, right? And, and we'll see who could figure out the theme here. Um, when, you know, you're, you're all obviously not in primary school. So let me, let me move on. When I was in form six, so I went to Fatima College. When I was in form six, the computer science teacher refused to teach me and a couple others in class because she said that we felt we knew too much and we could not learn from her. So she stopped teaching us. And so we had to do the computer science project on our own. Right now, if any of you guys have ever done an A-level computer science project, you know that it is madness, madness, right? Cambridge GCE wrote back to Fatima College and said, whatever your kids are doing, please stop doing it because they're showing up our master's level students. That's how good we were when we did our computer science projects at 17, 18 years old, right? We were showing up the master's students in the UK because our projects were bigger and fatter than them and it was freaking object oriented Pascal, right? I don't know what they were using, but they were probably using basic in the UK. So we had to drop out of school. So I dropped out of school again and we coded and we documented our projects and we printed it out and we got everything done on our, on our own, right? No support 
from any of the teachers. In fact, the teachers threatened to kick us out of school because we were not coming to school. They take me off whatever scholarship list they had. They had the little boys running <laughs> scholarship contenders. I was not one of them. I got scratched off the list. Um, I was a good student. They knew I was one of the top students, but they took me off the list because they felt because I was one of the computer people, I ain't going to have good grades. So I was like, okay, no problem. So we dropped out of school. We did what we had to do. Me and a couple of guys that I'd started a company with, and we coached ourselves. It was almost like a Silicon Valley startup, except we didn't know it at the time. We got a back room in a company. We slept there. We coded there. We ate there. Everything. We just lived out of this back room, and we got the project done. Because I was so far behind and because I was almost failing out of mock exams for A-levels, I had to catch up. So luckily my best friend was one of the scholarship boys and he pretty much told me, don't worry, you have six weeks, just do every pass paper for the last 10 years, three times. And I did the easy subjects. So these are subjects that were easy to me, subjects that I really, really liked. I did physics, maths, and computers. That's what I did for A-levels. Now, I didn't know until afterwards that apparently physics is one of the hardest A-level subjects, but it was easy for me. So we did these three subjects. I did the past papers, did them over and over and over, did it and graded it. Multiple choice that would take, give you an hour or four, I would do it and grade it in 20 minutes. So I knew I'd gotten good, but the ultimate test was A-levels itself. No support from the school, right? Remember, they want to transfer me to CIC at this point in time, right? So um, I just went, and I put my head down, and I did A-levels, and I got the open scholarship. Now, for those of you who are around my age, I did, I did A's in 92. Um, they only had one scholarship, eh? It's not like now. They have like 50 scholarships. They had one per category. So I got B1 scholarship, which paid my way to MIT, which I also happened to get into because of all the things that I had done that I really cared about. All right, so let's fast forward again. Let's keep moving. So I went to MIT, did entrepreneurship, did computer science, did artificial intelligence. Uh, MIT insists that you have to work in industry in order to really understand the field of engineering. So the top students get placed in uh, what's called a 6A internship program. Patrick knows about this program as well. So I, I was fortunate enough to be good enough to be one of the 6A students. And I got placed at a company called Hughes Network Systems. I don't know if you guys know Direct PC, Direct TV the satellite dish company. Well, that was a subsidiary of Hughes Network Systems at the time. Lo and behold, it's become a multi-billion dollar company. But that, that was a startup project of, of this company called Hughes Network Systems, which is where I got my internship. And when I was an engineer at Hughes in this MIT internship, I had to work on my thesis, right? My master's thesis because at MIT, you do masters and bachelors simultaneously. That's they see how it works because they don't really care about a bachelor's degree. They believe it's insufficient for the general workplace. So they encourage you to do masters and bachelors simultaneously. So here I am doing this thing and I hated this PhD, whatever kind of work, right? Hate it, I mean. I don't want to make Patrick feel bad, but I could never do what he has done in his life. I just never, I could never do <laughs> stuff like that. Uh, I was good at it, but I could never actually bring myself around to do it. Um, so I was kind of distracted and I was walking around the corridors at Hughes. And I ran into this woman. Now, let me tell you about Hughes Network Systems. Hughes Network Systems is like 15 cowboys from Texas and 3,000 Indians from India. That is pretty much the company, right? So it's me, 3,000 Indians, 
and 15 white people with cowboy hats. That, that, that's the kind of company I worked at, right? And I ran into this colored woman. So I was just like, wow, she's clearly not from around here like me. Um, turns out she's a Trinidadian and turns out she worked for the VP of International Business Development. So I'm like, cool, nice to meet you. She's like, you know what? I really want you to meet my boss. I'm like, cool, happy to do that. You know, so she was just thrilled meeting a Trinidadian that came from MIT. So she was happy to introduce me to her boss. So I said, all right, let me just prepare something for this meeting. So I went in, I found this Financial Times article. This is back in 1997-ish. Basdeo Pandey was the prime minister of Trinidad at the time. So I clipped out the article. I wrote up a little five-page executive summary. And I brought it into the meeting with this VP of International Business Development. His name was Vinod, Vinod Shukla. So I brought my little report in to Vinod. And, you know, he's just amused, right? Because here's his secretary that finds this intern and takes up his valuable time to meet with him, right? <laughs> so he's just like... This prime minister here of yours, he looks like he is from my village in India. Uh, it's just like, oh, God, here we go again, right? So he pointing at the name Pandey and saying Pandey is an Indian name and it's probably from the village he came from and this and that and the other. And he got so excited all of a sudden. He's just like, if you could get me a meeting with this Basdeo Pandey, I will set up an office in Trinidad and you could go work there. You know, he just want to give me big talk, right? Because he's a boss. He's the boss, right? So I'm just like, all right. I'm holding you to that. So I went back to my desk. It was, it was, it was, it was all Unix terminals at the time. And I fire up my email. And I start to send off emails to everybody that I knew in Trinidad. Who in corporate Trinidad is willing to take a meeting with Hughes Network Systems. And this one guy from Fatima named Keith Thomas responded to my email and said, I will take the meeting. So without boring you guys, but there's a lot of drinking and other usual Trinidadian is involved in the middle of the story, pushing motor car up the hill in 100 degree Fahrenheit weather with Ray Stewart, who is one of the most badass Trinidadian businessman you'll ever meet, getting him to come out of a car in his suit and push my Toyota Corolla with a dent on the top that a cricket ball hit when I was playing cricket with the Indian fellas, embarrassingly denting the top of the car, pushing, have this man pushing my little cheap little Toyota Corolla because the battery dead. We made it to the meeting. We made it to the meeting. I brought these execs from Trinidad and they met with Vinod. And long story short is because uh, I had also met some guys from Tidco um, and became very close with the guy who was running, with the vice president at Tidco, who was running Pandey's trade delegation. Uh, it turns out that he actually flew Basio Pandey up to meet the executive team at Hughes Network Systems. And when Neil and Massey distribute satellite dishes in Trinidad and Tobago and across the Caribbean, guess where that contract came from? You could write Keith Thomas, I'll give you his email. You could go and ask him if that's a true story or not. But anyhow, that's what I did when I was bored and I didn't want to write my thesis. I got my prime minister to meet with the CEOs of the company that I was working for. All right, so let's let's keep moving because I was still a student at the time. You all are past that. A lot of you all are graduated professionals in the industry and so on. So let's talk about my fourth, the fourth year of my first job after college. Now, by this time, I was working for a company called Sapient Corporation, which was headquartered in Cambridge, Massachusetts. But this is now 2001. Right, And the whole world is crashing and burning. But before the Twin Towers came down, I had volunteered to go over and lead up 
be one of the one of the uh, expatriates from the United States. Um, I, I, had, I had no status in the U.S. at this point in time, no citizenship. I was um, I was still an F one student. Yeah, still an F one student. Still working um, on my F one visa. I had uh, well, not F one. It it, uh, it it was the the H one H one part when you when you get to work after your F one. H one B. H one B. Yeah. H. Uh, so I was H one B. Ironically, working in India, right? And um, so the twin towers come down from our conference room in New Delhi, and uh, we had a major problem, right? Because we had hired all of these people in India. I had seven hundred people. Uh, to groom um, as one of the expats trying to grow these people. Most of them were straight out of school. They had no clue about how the world works, far less out the code. And I was coaching this guy who they wanted to fire, right? Because I they, they gave me a bunch of misfits. They gave me all the misfits. They're like, oh, here's 140 people. We're not sure if we need them at the company. Give them to Jeff. Because Jeff, Jeff is clearly the misfit leader. <laughs> so I remember this one particular guy. He was banded band one. When when you get banded band one, that means the next thing that's gonna happen is, is you're gonna get fired, right? So they gave him to me. So I sat down and I really spent the time understanding this guy. And I looked at all the core values of the company, client focus delivery, leadership relationships, people growth. And I, I just, I looked, at, I looked at everything that we were about as a company and what this guy was about. And he was not a bad guy. He just didn't get it, right? He just didn't understand certain tenets of how to work and how to translate his behaviors into things that materialize in value in the culture that we were building. So he is coming across as arrogant and know it all and too smart for his own good. Could not get anything done the way that the, the senior people wanted him to do it. And he was, he, was, he was branded a problem problem child in the company. So they gave him to me amongst others in the 140, right? That they gave to me. So I took this guy and I made him set up meetings for me. Very, very simple, because one of the things he couldn't do is figure out how to get stuff done on time, on scope, on budget, because that was all we were about. So I'm just like, here's what you're going to do. You're going to plan next week's meeting and everything that has to be done to get that meeting done, you're going to do it. Like my secretary. I didn't call him that, but he was basically my secretary. So I gave him very, very basic things to do. Not any software engineering, not no design, not no fancy C++, none of this stuff. I taught him how to use a calendar, right? Taught him how to use a calendar and the discipline of planning his work and working his plan, amongst other things. Long and short is after he rolled off of spending time with me a few months later, and working with me in my pressure cooker environment, where I, I groomed him, they put him on a project. And then six months later, they banded him. He ended up being banded band four, which is one of the top bands. Band five was the highest. So he went from a band one to a band four. And everybody, everybody that had problems in the company that got assigned to me had a very similar type of epiphany and just categorically improve the way that they were working in the company. So what happened was every year, the founders of the company look for the people across the company that make the biggest impact to Sapien, right? Now, remember we were a pretty significant company with a stock price that was $80, now trading at 60 cents because of the collapse of the, uh, of the stock market. But they still held true to the traditions of 
of what the company was about. And they went across the company and they found people that represented what we were about at Sapien. And they created this award from the very beginning. And every year they gave out the award called the Founders Award. And they were two founders, they were both billionaires. They were young, by the way. Jerry was 29 when the company IPO'd and Stuart was 35. They were young guys, but they were both billionaires. They were, I think on the, the list of young people, uh, they were number 13 and 14 on the list of people under Michael Dell. Michael Dell was number one and they were like 13 and 14. And so they ended up giving me the Founders Award. And one of the reasons they gave me the Founders Award is this guy amongst other people wrote that people who work with me receive the Midas touch. And all of a sudden you could turn lead into gold and this and that and the other. So it's just like, that's, that's all well and good, right? But I'm glad you all realize this now. You know, it's gonna shock you guys is that a few months before I got the Founders Award in the company, they rejected me from getting a promotion to becoming a project manager at the company, despite all the contributions I had made to the office. Just a few months before that, they told me I was not a good project manager because I went and bought up a set of people for not doing their jobs. So I'm like, okay, then you go and ball them up. I'm gonna do what I need to do. And I got the Founders Award. So they went and asked the person who didn't give me the promotion, how do you feel? She said, I feel like an ass. <laughs> um, so I got the Founders Award and uh, I didn't think much of it at the time. I was pretty proud of it because obviously building a company and turning it around and surviving the collapse of the entire uh, technology industry was, was quite a feat for us as a company. And we did survive. Sapient is now like a company of a hundred companies. It's one of the largest conglomerates in the creative design space. Um, but it turns out, and it's very likely, I don't know for certain, but it, it's very likely that, that that founders award is what gave me the chance to get into Harvard Business School because it differentiated me in, in getting into the one school that I had applied to, right? Um, so yeah, so that was a story four years into my career. More recently, and, 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 and probably to address the curiosity that some of you guys have in terms of our more, more recent success. Um, some of you probably know Medulin. Some of you guys probably know the people from Medulin, but I literally laid the bricks of building Medulin, which is the largest and to, at least at the time when I, I led it was the largest enterprise software company in the Caribbean, in the English speaking Caribbean. We had a hundred people from Trinidad and Jamaica. Um, so between 2005 after business school and 2015, when I was pushing this boulder up a hill of building that company, um, we were constantly, constantly going to the who's who of the venture capital industry. I lived in Boston at the time still in Boston, right? Went to Boston for MIT, still in Boston. Was it Boston for Sapient? Went back to Boston after India. Boston my ass in Boston, in the goddamn freezing cold, slipping on ice, breaking my fingers, all kind of nonsense. And every single time we pitched to these venture capitalists, they would tell us $3 million is a series A and you guys are not ready for series A. So we cannot give you $3 million. So I'm just like, okay. So I came out to California, visited a friend of mine who was my year at MIT. We used to drink together back in the day. And he told me he just put $10 million of seed capital, not series A, seed capital on a business, but he doesn't know how to lead it because they have nobody to sell to the healthcare industry. And what the hell had we been doing at Medulin for the last 10 years? 
sell into health insurance companies. So we pretty much took the commercial engine of how we sold to health insurance companies and moved it into this company called Levongo. And if you want to Google Levongo Health, it is known as the fastest growing company in Palo Alto, which is the capital of technology in the year 2019. And for all of those years that it, it rapidly grew from startup with 10 million in seed funding, 200 and 30 million dollars, no, not even that much, $150 million later, uh, the company went public. And in October, um, I'm forgetting which year this is now, I think it's October, 2020, um, Livongo was acquired by Teladoc for $18.5 billion, $100 billion TT dollars. One company, startup, five years old, we built it. So I just wanna keep an eye on time to our end, but can anybody tell me what the common theme of these stories is? Because this is actually educational for me as well to look back in terms of what I wanted to share with you guys in trying to help with your aspirations and try to just put together a few uh, anecdotes that hopefully will be helpful. Hopefully they will be entertaining, but can anybody offer what the common theme is amongst all of those stories I shared? Do you still in chat or do you still by voice? Either. Either in chat or if you guys want to unmute. I'll go after everybody. Hey, Mark. Mark, you took my line. <laughs> well, you, you could say it again. You just copy paste. Oh. <laughs> but let me let me let me start the let me let me start the guesses. Um I, I, I felt that there was a lot of while there was a lot of ad, adversary. You, you had some adverse conditions, but you knew you, you kind of saw a pathway through and, and, and a goal and you didn't let anyone tell you, hey, no, you can't. That's that's one thing I got from that. I see uh, Jade said great communication and determination. That's another it's another thing that's common within that list. Anyone else? Keep chatting. Keep chatting. Uh, oh. I would go with that you're very capable of, um, of making people work for you and work towards your goals. And then you tend to inspire people into doing things that ultimately help you achieve your goal. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's um, added value in all dimensions, so to the product and to the people. And then to your customer will go. So, you know, you sort of see whatever you need in for the employer, the product, and the, and the person buying the product. And you sort of just go for that. Like that. Um, Rogansi, uh, you want you want me to say it or do you want to say what you wrote? You can say it. <laughs> Oh, okay. All right. Well, leadership planning and networking. Bro, you could have done that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think these are all all great. Um, We're missing all great something. Assertions. All great assertions. Mark, Mark you said you in. wanted to go? Yeah, yeah. Let me see if I, if I give away the secret that I've learned. Um, visibility. Executive visibility getting shit done that's maybe yeah, i would sum it up like that jeff i'll leave it for you to yeah, expand but that's and, that's what and, i've been i don't I, I don't know how much executive visibility i had in the grocery store you know um oh yeah we go back to grocery but store, yeah, there, okay, there's, okay. there's definitely there's definitely an aspect of that so and, and i think all you guys are right and, and, and there's definitely a a strong uh signal to noise in terms of what you guys have pulled out much better than i could have summarized this 
because I only just thought about this story this afternoon for you guys, right? Um, but what I what I feel best kind of describes this thing here is the feeling that I had when I was in Trinidad working for for IBM. Or oh, did Jordan want to go? Did somebody else want to go as well? I see Renisha said, starting small, building up from there. Yeah. Yeah, Jordan said, I think it's that you didn't give up or pack it in regardless of what situations you met. Yeah. I yeah, mean, I was not about to unmute. I'm sorry. I think, okay. I, think a lot, I think a lot of us as Trinidadians, as West Indians have that determination, right? Um, but anyhow, the, the, the thing that I felt is the theme here is when the world is not giving me what I feel is the best opportunity, what should my response be, right? So, you know, I, I know we have questions and stuff like that. So I'll kind of just summarize here and then we could, we could transition into questions. But how I would summarize it for you guys in, in terms of things that I would hope you guys take away from, from my career is the first thing you have to do is really understand the foundation that you're standing on. Right. The second thing is you have to put yourself out there, sign up the fellowship and take a risk. Right. If you don't put yourself out there, you don't know what your odds are. Right. And, and not every time have the odds worked out in my favor. Right. But there are many instances which fundamentally and categorically move my life my bank account, my happiness, my family, everything that you're supposed to be working towards moved it categorically forward, not linearly forward, exponentially forward, like with one or more extra zeros on the end type of moving forward, right? And I think the last thing about the theme here, the third thing, have to put yourself out there is there will always be fewer others than you think who choose to also enter the game. So even though the odds when you take risks seem enormous, right? Applying to Harvard Business School is like a it's like 14,000 people apply, right? To get in to 900 seats at the business school. Does that mean you don't apply? I mean, because your odds are less than rolling, rolling a dice, right? Uh, does it mean you don't apply? Uh, one, of, one of my managers at Sapient at the time asked me what my odds were from getting in. And at that point in time, I had actually gotten the interview, which meant that I knew my odds were better than 50-50 at that point in time. And he's like, oh, I don't think that sounds very good at all. I'm like, dude, I just went from one in 14,000 to one in two. You don't think my odds are good? <laughs> um, so, you know, odds are kind of very deceptive and, and they're also very subjective, right? Um, but when you are standing on a solid foundation that you really, really know, right? When I was doing A-levels and I knew that I knew my shit because I had done my homework, right? I knew it was a, a gamble to go off and, and do this thing and get a scholarship, but I went for it, right? The odds work out in your favor, despite the fact that, that, that they're enormous. Um, anyhow, so those are the three takeaways um, that I would offer from at least that subset. I, I, there's more, I'm happy to, to answer questions about the rest of my journey, but um, you know, I just kind of probably end with three little known facts and then, uh, we could we could switch to questions. I could either read some of the questions that folks sent ahead of time, or we could just open it up for questions. Sorry, and but uh, so three quick little known facts about me uh, before we wrap up. Um, one is I work with a guy named Jeremy Hilton at MIT, and uh, he is actually an early developer of Python. He's been developing Python since 1996, um, and he's still a director of the the Python Software Foundation. He's now at Google. Um, Another interesting fact is that uh, 
the first mention of a Caribbean website, and Patrick was around at the time. He actually knows the website that I'm talking about. The first mention of, of a Caribbean website in PC Magazine was our website at MIT. So we took MEPs with MEPs permission. We took, you know, the magazine that used to be back in the back of BWI when it was called BWI, Caribbean Airlines now, the magazine that was in there. And we scanned in all the pictures and the text and we typed it in and, and we built up a web page at MIT. And that became one of the most popular web pages back in the 90s about the Caribbean. And uh, other funny little known fact about me is that when I was 10 years old, I also won 12 and under. So if anybody that's from Trinidad and who remembers what 12 and under was, yes, I was one of Auntie Hazel's um, projects as well. So that's it for me. Uh, Torian, what do you want to do about questions? <laughs>